and those doubts get lessened or eliminated. So that was something else I had to learn, is you, know, you have to have faith and belief in yourself, but instead of it in myself, I had to have faith and belief in the church. So when someone says, I just cannot believe the church, I go, okay. Well, the church teaches more, and they're really upset at somebody. But if I go, well, who is the church? The first thing they almost always say is, well, uh, um, the bishops and the pope. And I go, okay. Uh, who's in charge of the church? So I'm asking you that question. Who's in charge of the church? Jesus Christ. Jesus, right? I mean, he's the head of the church. That's what the church says. Mm -hmm. and, he's with, right? and who guides the church? The Holy Spirit, right? Now, if we say we are, which isn't a bad answer, because we are, what, members of the body of Christ, yeah. that's a good answer. But we're not the head. We're the body. Okay. So Christ is the head. So Christ is in charge. So every time we complain about the church, who are we complaining about? <laughs> Jesus. I mean, I hate to tell you that, but when you go, ah, that church, blah, 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 just remember who you're talking to. Because you ain't talking to Deacon David. You're talking directly to the man in charge, the head of the church. So when people do dumb things in the name of the church, those are, that's a human element. <coughs> but Jesus allows that human element into his church. And, that's, and that human element can sin and can be led astray. Right? So yeah, we have bad priests sometimes, and we have bad deacons, and we have bad people that work for the church sometimes. It's going to happen. But in the end, the church is still... So I had to get used to this idea that the church was ultimately right, and I had to figure out why. Because the church isn't going to be wrong, because if it's between me being wrong and Jesus as the head of the church being wrong. <laughs> I knew... Self-confident, arrogant Deacon David versus Jesus? Are you kidding me? I had to go, eh, maybe I don't know so much. Maybe I better learn something. Maybe I better figure this out. You know? So that's why we have spiritual advisors, directors, theologians, etc. to help us to work through our questions and our doubts. But that was important too. Was I, I, it wasn't alone. I, I didn't have to put faith in myself. Uh, I had to put faith in the church and with others. Um, another thing I learned uh, through this process was I had to learn um, not to give up. And, and, you know, for people that like to win, um, they're not good losers. <coughs> you know? And once it becomes obvious you're not going to win, are you going to be a good sport about it? Or are you going to be a miserable loser <laughs> about it? And there isn't much difference. Because inside, most of us are miserable losers. We don't like losing, and we're miserable in here. Now, on the outside, we can do a great job of putting on a good face. But inside, we know that it's not real. And so, um, just a little, little story on this, because it's just so accurate in, about this, is that I, I hated losing. I mean, big time. And, and, and so when I was playing golf tournaments, I didn't, if someone said to me, you, you did really great, you know, you got fifth place. I mean, I just wanted to smack that person. I mean, it wasn't a compliment to me. They thought they were being complimentary. To me, it was just like, totally, you know. So, so my junior year, I finished second in our conference in, in golf in high school, and the kid that won was much better than me. I, I knew that, but I still was bummed when I finished second. So next year, I was, he, was, he graduated, so I'm like, I'm gonna win next year. So I did, and that was no big deal. I, I knew I was the best golfer, I knew I was gonna win. Does that sound arrogant? <laughs> So, then I, so that, was, that, that confirmed itself. So then I go to college, and I win my conference tournament my sophomore year, my junior year, and I'm the best golfer, and I know it, and everyone else knows that I know it. Back to Michael Jordan. I just didn't win, to win by a little bit. I wanted you to know that I was the best golfer, and I acted like it. So that was not good. So my senior year, I'm going to win again, because I've done this before. I know how to win. I'm the best golfer. i played these kids before. I'm, I'm, I'm better than them. And I got a two-stroke lead with four holes to go, and this guy named Dan Kelly <laughs> makes three putts in a row. Two from off the green. <laughs> and I end up losing by two strokes. Mm -hmm. This doesn't happen to me, because it doesn't. I've just done it my senior year in high school. I did it my sophomore and junior year. My freshman year, I was ineligible, because I, I had transferred it from out of state. So, um, so anyway, I, uh, I'm just not taking this real well. It's my last tournament my senior year, right? And I just lost. So I have to be a good sport. 
So they give me the second place trophy and I have to thank them. <laughs> I had to graduate the winner, who I played with since I was a freshman in high school. So I played with this kid for eight years. And I knew who was better, and he knew who was better, but that day, I wasn't better. Oh, that, that was miserable. So I go, I go to this banquet to celebrate <laughs> our season, and all the athletes are there from my university. So it's all the women's softball players and soccer players and men's soccer and men's cross country, women's track and all that stuff. Basketball. And I'm used to this whole charade where they give you these awards, right? And they recognize you for all these things. And every year I get up there and I'm the conference champion, I'm the most valuable golfer, and they talk about me, and I go home with a big head, and it's great. <laughs> so it's not going to happen this year because this year I didn't win. So my golf coach um, tells a story of what a good sport I was. <laughs> Davis, his heart was broken. He, he, he always wins, but he didn't win that day. And he, he was a perfect gentleman. He, he graduated the winner, and I'm going, that's on the outside, dude. On the inside, it was just the opposite. How could that lucky SOB make four, three putts in a row from that far away? <laughs> How could this happen to me? This isn't right. And I can do nothing about it. I mean, that's what's so hopeless about it, right? It's over, you know? So I came home that night, and I was listening to God tell me, I remember this conversation going, how can he lie about me like that? Like, how can my golf coach lie about that? Because he knew me well enough to know that there was no sportsmanship involved <laughs> with me. <laughs> because I wasn't a good sport. In fact, I was a bad winner. And, and, and I wasn't a good loser for that matter either. But he painted this beautiful picture of me being such a good sport and so mature and such a you know, fine young man. Bullshit. <laughs> but I'm not. I'm a greedy, competitive winner who doesn't like to lose and was mad as hell that that SOB got lucky making those putts. And yet, I was given accolades for my maturity and my sportsmanship. <laughs> but there was a message there. And I, and I didn't miss it. I missed it when I was 20, but as I reflected back on it, there was a message there that said, how do you match up what I project out here to what's really in here? How big a gap is there between the person I am, really, and the person that you all see? Or am I authentic? Do I have integrity? Do I act the same way <coughs> behind the wheel of a car <coughs> when someone cuts me off in traffic as I do <coughs> at the consecration? <laughs> you know, see what I'm saying? Am I that same person 24-7? Or am I just sort of transactional and I, and I, and I operate in two worlds where I operate this way in one world and that way in another world. And that's right where I was. And I got it. It took me a long time to figure it out. But God was trying to tell me, you got this huge gap between who you want people to see and who you really are. And you've got to close that gap. And it isn't about changing, the, be more genuine on the outside. It was about you need to change your insides because you should have genuinely been happy for a person who succeeded. You know, you should have genuinely been a good sport and said, you played great today, Dave. Good job. And not be all the things I was that day. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're 21, it's tough. Because your identity is tied into that image, right? Make sense? Mm -hmm. So that was a major learning for me, is how do I get this <coughs> inside to match that good outside that people see? The, pe the person in private is the same as the person in public. So I had to learn that. Um, so a couple other things that were really important. One is um, about giving up, and I mentioned you know, persevering, you know, staying with it. Another one was um, having a positive belief. Uh, and also, another one, just real simple, is just make sure you're at the right level. So one thing for me was, um, I'm not Tiger Woods. And if I went out there to try to play against those guys that play on Sundays and I watch on TV, I'd get killed. I mean, they play a whole different game. If you don't even watch these guys, they hit the ball so far and they're so good that if I said, I'm a really good golfer, and they, they would look at me like, really? <laughs> and you watch us on Sunday? Yeah. Because I hit my good shots and they don't look like they're good shots. Okay. So I had to realize, look, I'm just this one person and 
Knoxville, Tennessee. I'm not the Pope. I'm not a bishop. I'm not a priest. I'm going to have limited impact. Uh, I've got two kids. I don't have dozens. I've got uh, a circle of friends, not millions. So what I had to learn was, you know, use your position appropriately, you know, and, and to not try to strive for something outside of your realm of influence, but to work well on your circle of influence. So where can I make a difference? And that, that took a while to figure that out, too. And, I, and, and, I, and the reason I bring the competition <coughs> angle into this is I had to realize I can only compete at certain levels. So I couldn't compete in NCAA Division I, Oklahoma State or Alabama, where these golf teams are incredible. I wasn't that good. So I didn't do that. I played in the conference in Chicago, where I played teams like DePaul and Loyola and uh, uh, Eastern Illinois University. And you know, they weren't your golf schools. They were just a lot of the basketball schools, quite frankly, if you follow college basketball. DePaul and Loyola at the time were very good. So um, I had to just realize, you know, I'm just, I'm just kind of a little fish in a really big ocean. And I just got my minimal influence in this little area. But I have a big influence when it comes to a child or a spouse or a friend. And now in some lives of parishioners. And you realize you are really important in their life. And it's humbling. But at the same time, you realize God put you in that role. So Gene and Jerry and I are in a men's group. How many years have we been meeting Gene? Uh, about 12 now. Yeah. Can, Can you imagine well? putting up with me and Gene for 12 years? <laughs> and Jerry, how many years? Uh, at least two. You, yeah. you were, you were, you were almost. almost in the original group, weren't you? Or yeah, were you in the yeah. Well, yeah, maybe a year or two. Yeah, maybe. Okay. So um, we put up with each other for 11 or 12 years. Now, if anybody that knows Gene <laughs> and me knows, man, that's got to be, you had to, you had to, for that many years, you've been, how, how have you, once, once a week? That's 52 times 12. That's 600 times. We spent, can you imagine we spent 600 plus hours? Butting arguing. heads. We spent 600 plus hours butting heads. Yeah. Arguing about who's right. <laughs> what the church teaches. Why this? Why this? And, and it's great because I need Gene because Gene helps me and challenges what the church teaching is or what I think the church teaching is. We had a great little thing that he was talking about jealousy and envy, and I'm like, Jealousy is good. And she's like, it's never good. And I went and we researched it, and the team was right. <laughs> she was right again. And it happens. You know? Every now and then you just have to go, darn it, you know? I was wrong on that one. Nobody likes to say that, but it is. We do that. So that's going to happen. Um, so we, we support each other that way. You know, someone challenges, someone supports, someone has, like, uh, one of our... Um, Distinguished friends there, Jerry's had some issues with his neck, right? And I know you've had some things happen recently, right? And we're there to pray for each other. And we're there to be supportive. Uh, one of our members, his wife had cancer. We're there praying for her. In fact, we got Mass this Wednesday for her. Uh, so it's, it's that kind of stuff. And you realize, you know, you're in a small way compared to Pope Francis or Bishop Barron or whatever. But yet, in those people's lives, it's important. <coughs> that you're there and that you know it's a weekly kind of everything is there for we're there for each other you know and I know if I ask Gene for something he's there Gene knows if you ask me hopefully you know I'm there um, because we are that, that there's that kind of bound that develops so that was something else that I think was important to me was I had to realize this is the right level for you and don't feel bad that you're not Matthew Kelly uh oh, what was what was that? Do you not like Matthew Kelly? Go ahead. Right. Now you now you stepped in it. Now what's that about? Matthew Kelly's good. You've had a lot of book clubs. Yeah. You always have yeah. his, his yeah. books. But you really oh you reacted funny. Why was that? She hasn't survived yet. <laughs> That's what now? You haven't come out of her, her pit yet. Yeah. <laughs> um <laughs> Each of us are very different. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> and uh, and part of what makes us beautiful is that we are different. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. And if we can just celebrate our difference. Absolutely. Uh, you know. Yeah. Um, 
when um, it, it's a long story, <laughs> but um, <coughs> one of the greatest things that you talk about way back when, uh, I, I uh, grew up in a kind of different way, I suppose, but we all do. Yeah. I um, remember um, finding out I couldn't go to school and have it paid for with $500 that was granted to me by a nurse's group. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I did some deep thinking, probably as a 16, 17 year old. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I remember writing to get to college because uh, it, it, that's another long story. So anyway, I end up there. And I, what I wrote was probably something I wish I had a copy of. And what it was, was I was very isolated in some people's terms. I was very happy, but I took care of my younger brothers and sisters mm -hmm. for many years. So as an 11-year-old, I'm a little mama. Mm -hmm. So my world was very small. Mm -hmm. And suddenly my world was going to get even bigger than college, I mean, either out of high school. Mm -hmm. And I kept noticing people, and I kept thinking, oh, that's who Jesus is. I'm meeting Jesus all the time. I met Mimi this morning and I thought, oh, she's got that peace that I love. Mm -hmm. And the more people I meet, I found out something was happening to me. Mm -hmm. I was becoming alive. Mm -hmm. So yeah. when you talk about competition, mm -hmm. man, did you grow up with eight brothers and sisters? You had how many? Three. What's your problem? <laughs> being the oldest girl yeah. Yeah. and have four older brothers yeah. and try to live with that and try to get enough to eat. <laughs> I hear you. Yeah. So yeah. it's so interesting how there's a bigger piece out there. Absolutely. Yeah. And we do not understand it. Right. And my um, brother, my oldest brother who's still living at 80, he says, um, uh, the gift of years. So as a 76-year-old person, Jared keeps making me a year older. <laughs> <laughs> he can like, do that to you. <laughs> it's, it's the same. That's whatever, you know. <laughs> I'm surprised uh, it's just a year. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. It's it's the gift of years. Yeah. And yeah. it's the gift of perspective. Yeah. And if we can see that in one another, yeah. and to me, after coming out of horrible years with COVID, mm -hmm. with isolation, mm -hmm. um, that's the most valuable gift to yeah. me right now, yeah. is having the ability to be able to sit down and just like today, this was a great gift. Mm -hmm. I thought you were, when I first met you, I thought, I don't like him. <laughs> <laughs> You're thought, probably accurate. Most he's, <laughs> he's, 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 a, he's a bookhead. Yeah. Yeah. And now today I'm like, <laughs> This is beautiful. I'm like, you're alive to me. I can hear yeah. you. Yeah, I'm not really so did bullshit. you change or did Eleanor change? Yes. And that's the beauty. Yes, <laughs> probably yes. I'm that's the yeah. beauty of yeah. being alive. Yeah. It, it really yeah. is. Yeah, it's beautiful. I don't know if I, you know, I'm a little weird, you know. No, I'm not. I don't smoke dope or anything. <laughs> <laughs> Where is that? <laughs> well, I'm in your camp. What do you say, Kathy? I was just wondering what that has to do with Matthew Kelly. I couldn't hear you. What does that have to do with Matthew Kelly? Yes. When you read about Matthew Kelly, he went through hell for a long time. Yeah, he, he did. He had a hard time. Yeah. Okay. He had a hard time. And he was trying to be all these things to all these people. Yeah. And then after he got bashed around a little bit, he became who, who we know and love. Yeah. And so sometimes in life when we're getting bashed, I don't know what else to call it. We're getting humbled. We're getting yeah. Yeah. decimated, either physically, mentally, the stuff that goes on around us. Mm -hmm. We're being remade. Yeah. We're being remade to our authentic. Yeah, and that's that's what this. Yeah, you know, like what I was finding out is this preparation for it, and some of this stuff, right? Oh. Yeah. So, so we appreciate who we're really meant to be. I can just suck, see yeah. you sucking it up when you're. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what we're sort of put in our place. Where, who we really are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And God leading us into that. And yeah. we're, we're kicking and screaming probably as he's trying to do it, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I heard on the sports talk yesterday, or today, Friday, Jason Swain, former UT football player, 
quote Matthew Kelly without saying it. He said, we're all out here to be the best version of ourselves. Yeah. And I was, whoa, almost yeah. wrecked. <laughs> yeah. Flash back to yeah. David Amos' glove. Yeah. Yeah. Is that the guy that's coaching at uh, the Christian school? Is, is that the yeah. guy? Yeah. Do the, I know? The, the, is What's that the fellow that's coaching at yes. the Christian school? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was the story of redemption. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, beautiful. Yeah, and if our church can can come together and provide that kind of network, I really feel strongly that's what we're called mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's yeah, not fluff. It's yeah, we're real. not called as individuals. We're called as a church. Yeah, and we're part of that survival. Yeah. Yeah. We, we have to be a survival that. net yeah. for the fish. Yeah, yeah. And so your experience is so beautiful because through all that absence of good health and community during COVID and separation and isolation, all that, you said something very interesting. You said it changed your perspective, right? So, yeah, you did change. Your perspective changed the way you saw everything. The, the world didn't change that much, but the way you saw the world <laughs> really changed, right? Yeah. Well, we, when you're laying on the COVID unit, Yeah. Uh, and um, you're having troubles. And then you notice, because you're a nurse, you notice that something weird happened in here. <laughs> yeah. So this uh, wonderful nurse comes in, and he's in a full moon suit. And people were so unprepared. And even the unit was not quite prepared. So he comes in with an EKG, because he's going to check my heart. I said, it's, it's still beating. Don't panic. We're OK still. You know? <laughs> and so, so then he le puts leads on and everything. He starts checking. The, the, it's flatlining. And I'm looking at it and I'm going, don't get excited. It's, it's, got, it's not me, it's got to be the machine. <laughs> yeah. 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 And he's telling me, he says, you know, I've had some troubles myself. He says, I'm hard of hearing. <laughs> he says, I'm glad you told me that. Because like, he couldn't take his mask off and put on his stethoscope. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I thought it was the funniest experience yeah. of my life. Yeah. And I'm like, that is so funny. You know? yeah. So can we sustain ourselves? Yeah. Yeah. And that's the God moment. Yeah. That's the God moment. Yeah. Because he's never not here. Right. Yeah. And it's beautiful. Yeah. If you can live that way, you live with such great right. peace. And, and and see that he's trying to lead you toward your best version of yourself, right? He's trying to lead you into that perspective where you see things the way he wants you to see them. Yeah. <clears throat> Which is hard when it's all about me. I'm not really interested in God helping me. <laughs> I was in the Roman world, or I was for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, let me just check your time here. So, um, let's take a break now. While you're on break, we'll, we'll get back, let's say 1045, let's take a little break. Um, I want you to think of, are we done at 11? Yeah. yeah. Oh, let's not take a break, that's too close. Okay. <laughs> we'll just go on a little early instead. Um, other people's perspectives, because I was chit-chatting along about history and <clears throat> what is you were listening, anything grab you that you kind of were related to or just something that you either thought was a good insight or just the opposite, maybe you disagreed with me, oh man, I don't agree with that at all. Just as you were listening, anybody have any thoughts that kind of came to them that you maybe have a shared experience or just want to share? Mike, yep. I'm on a Southern sibling. Okay. And right in the middle. And I was very, very competitive as well. Mm -hmm. I was probably one of the most, more, most competitive of the kids. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was hard because I didn't win a lot. I mean, mm -hmm. I had two older brothers. And, uh, so I can relate to that. Yeah. And, uh, in my late teen years, uh, I was in a room, and the room next door that didn't know I was there, somebody said, no, I don't want to play with him because he doesn't so he's a sore loser. He's a he's mm -hmm. a bad sport, and I got really happy thinking. Uh huh. You yeah. heard that? I heard that. Yeah, uh -huh. you were a bad sport from yeah. from, from yeah. an adult. From yeah. When I was a teenager. Oh yeah. Well, I was. I mean, it's sad to say, but in a way, I, I didn't like it when people weren't bad sports. It's like I expect you to be a bad sport because then you care. You know, and so I would see people that weren't like a few a few would come. I lost, but I'm I'm good. I'd be like. What's wrong with you? I mean, that's terrible. You just accept being a loser? That's who you are? I mean, that would drive me crazy. So I, if people, oh, it's okay. I'm, really? That's okay? And then, so, and, and then, you know, you can imagine what, so I, I, I was a director of accounting. I had 30-something people working for me. Can you imagine working for me? Oh, 
expectations. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. High expectations. We don't fail. We don't make mistakes. We, we, you know, we, we and I, and I, I had to really be careful because I, I realized that I was insane about this sort of stuff, and so I had to really be careful to, to tone it down and, and be encouraging, not beating up people when they failed. Uh, not treating them like losers because they didn't succeed, et cetera. So I, had, I really had to shift. And that was good, too. I mean, I learned that. And that was part of God's preparation for me, was learning how to deal with people and, and, and building them up, not tearing them down. Mm -hmm. But I was hardest on myself, you know, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't be as hard on other people. And so just a funny moment that hit me, and I was it just, you know, God humbles us in, in so many funny ways. But I was at a men's thing over at St. Thomas. It was... Uh, a series that they were doing, and I was going every Saturday, and they were talking um, to us men about um, our sin and, and what bothers us most about our sin. What what do you have a hard time, hard time letting go of? So if any, of you, if any of you have this experience, you go into confessional and you got a whopper that's bothering you. And you can talk about, well, I got mad at a fellow driver and I got mad at... Um, that person said something or that person gossiped about me or that person, you know, said it was a bad sport or whatever, you know. But then there's a whopper there. And you don't really want to deal with it. And you just want to ignore it and, and, and kind of put it to the side. Well, I, I had whoppers that I hadn't dealt with with competition. And they were still bothering me. So I'm sitting there and he's saying, what, what things really bother you? And I thought, you know, when I was 12 years old, I was pitching and my team lost the game because I messed up. I was still carrying that crap with me for 49 freaking years. Yeah. This was still in there, going, how could I have failed? I mean, I, there was two outs in the last inning. Mm -hmm. We were ahead by five runs, and I let six runs in. Yeah. And we lost. How does this happen? It happens to other people, but not me. I mean, that was where I was. So that just doesn't make sense. Go ahead, yeah, it was good. it's interesting, your example, because that is scholarship and I pitched baseball in college. And if, uh, for example, you got up against me and you hit a home run, the next time you got up, you're probably <laughs> going to get a pitch right in your damn ear, you yeah. know? <laughs> I mean, seriously. Yeah. And, and I grew up in many ways like that, is that the, the, to compete me is one thing, but to look at the result of the first thing and, and figure out and take the opportunity to look at what happened yeah. and grow from that. And that experience also is a part of life in my faith. Absolutely. You That's know? what I'm trying to, yeah. Kind of yeah, say. and, and yeah. I mean, I don't, I, I hate, like, heck to fail in anything yeah. that has to do with my life of faith, yeah. but I do. Yeah. And, and it's a gift. Yeah. Okay, failure in some ways, it is, it's crazy to say, but it represents an opportunity Mm -hmm. to grow again. Yeah. And it took a long time to be able to realize that. Yeah. To know how to happen again. Yeah. I don't, want, I don't want to keep repeating this pattern that results in failure, right? Right. Yeah. If, if I, I coached youth sports since 1976. It's a thing I did. Keep them coaching kids, you have to do be more than just let's win. Yeah. One of the things that I tried to convince them about is competition is good, winning is great, but losing is not really losing as long as you understand that that person that beat you is making you better. And ultimately, the competition that we have that is the greatest is with ourselves. Absolutely. Is making ourselves better. Mm -hmm. And that's why you're in competition for that person to make you better. Yeah. That came to roost, most of all, at confession. <laughs> at, my, at my age, yeah. I don't have any sexy sins anymore. <laughs> it's like, it's, not, it's, it's the worst one. I don't have enough faith. And that's the one I say all the time. Mm -hmm. Father Michael repeated the same advice to me yeah. twice. Yeah. Uh, he said, getting into heaven you can't earn. Right. And you'll never know that you're going to get into heaven. You may have confidence that you've done everything you can, but you'll never know because it's God's choice. Right. And I said, well, Jesus, what can I do? And he says, well, all you can do is the best you can do as long as it's the best you can do. Yeah. Right. And I think that's what we're in competition for, yeah. Yeah. to make sure that we're doing the best that yeah. we can. Yeah. And we don't. Right. We fail. Yeah. 
And so I, I kind of try to alleviate that failure by saying, well, I'm, I'm never going to do everything I can do because that's our human nature, right? I mean, whatever our success rate is, we're hitting some low level of our potential, no matter what we think we can do. I'm sure God has a plan for us that we maybe get a little bit of a picture of, but we don't ever get there. But I always take solace in the fact that, yeah, but if I just save one soul, if I'm instrumental in my wife's salvation, or I'm instrumental in Gene and Jerry's and our men's group salvation, or I'm instrumental in, then my own salvation, I don't want to be disqualified like St. Paul says, but I kind of look at it as, I think God will be pleased that I will I have been a, a useful instrument like Mother Teresa was in her way. Um, the, the great saints were in their way. You know? So I just kind of look back at that and say, yeah, as an individual, I'm going to have my blemishes just like everybody else is, but can I, in a sense, make up for it a bit by bringing more and more souls to Christ? You know, that's my rationalization, my way of um, hoping to please Him, to, to show my love for Him by bringing people to Him. Um, and not so much about me accomplishing anything, just because out of love for that person and out of love for Christ. So that, so that was really important. So a couple little lessons I want to share with you real quick. Um, and, and some of these you've already mentioned, so I just wanted to share a couple of these. Number one, I, I learned is you're always in a battle. Always. I, I, anybody that thinks that this life is about something else is just, to me, just totally misguided. I mean, you are in the middle of a battle every moment of every day. Because you got the devil on one shoulder, and you got the Holy Spirit within you, and you're constantly in that fight. Do I do the right thing? Do I do the thing God wants me to do? Or do I do the thing that maybe the devil's leading me toward, or I want to do out of selfishness? So and it's, and it's, it's, always, and it's always the easier thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so it's usually the easier thing, yeah. and the most things to glorify myself instead yeah. of God, and so on. So it's just, I, I just recognize day in, day out, I'm in a battle, and I'm a servant in Christ's army, and I'm no general. I'm just a little... <laughs> No matter what, I don't know what the lowest level is, but whatever is below corporal or private, I'm even below that, right? I'm like the person who would wash his feet. I'm, I'm, I'm lowering myself. I just, I'm just this little tiny person in Christ's big army. And just, just remember that I'm in this battle, but I serve Christ and his army, not the devil. So that's one. Um, another thing is, is just always have that faith in God and trust in his timing. And then I have to have hope and not despair. So I always go back to... Peter had hope even though he messed up. Judas had despair and went off and killed himself. I trust that God will bring out the best in me. I believe in him. I believe that you know, he doesn't fail. And so he works with a, a person that's very limited and yet brings about good because he's doing it, not me. So that was part of what I was talking about my homily this morning. Do you hear the Holy Spirit speaking to you or do you just hear me giving a talk? And I hope that people hear this, hear God's word, so that it, it, it um, compels them or in, it motivates them to, to change um, themselves and their actions. Um, another thing is that I learned um, through all this, and this is a funny one for me because I was so bad at it, was being prepared. Um, you know, I, you need to know what you're doing. And, and when I was a kid, I did the least to achieve the most. I mean, I was. I was, I mean, I'm telling you, I was just downright dastardly. I mean, if I could get away with cheating, I did. If I could get away with, you know, copying, plagiarizing, mm -hmm. doing the minimum, I did. Because I had one objective, which was to do as little as possible to get the highest grade. And I, and I felt that that was smart. Like, if I could get away with stuff and get, not get caught and get an A, woohoo! That gave me more time to goof off. And I'm smarter than even a teacher. Because he didn't catch me. Screwed up, but admittedly, I mean, that's where I was. So I didn't prepare well. So when kids would study for tests, my view was, you poor thing. Not admiring them for studying, but how stupid you are, you have to study. Can't you figure this stuff out without just, like, like just by showing up and taking the test? So just, just total arrogance and total misguidedness, and I was there. So what I had to learn was, you actually need to prepare. That's why I have notes. You know, you actually, you actually have to think about what you're going to do and work at it. So that was one thing I, I just didn't do. And that was one of my main lessons I learned was, you need to be prepared. So when I show up for Mass on Sunday, and God, I love Father Michael, don't get me wrong. But he used to drive me crazy when he'd say, 
Well, today's homily is about the parishioner I met right before Mass, and I, I'm like, you're winging it. Are you, did you just come up with this in 30 seconds ago? And the answer was, yeah, he did. Well, I can't do that. I, I just won't do that. Because I owe you, to me, I owe you something when I'm up there for 10 or 15 minutes. I owe you time that is valuable. So I don't just wing it. I get up there with a plan. And I, and I know what I'm going to start with. I know what I'm going to say. I know my theme. I know what I want you to do. My action item for you. And it may be lousy, but I prepared it. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Father Michael had a gift. I'm not, I'm not picking on him. He had a tremendous gift. Charisma, sales, etc., etc. But when he would do that stuff, I go, man, I just can't do that. That's not fair to people. I want to be prepared. So that's just me. And I still love Father Michael. I mean, but every now and then he would wing one and he'd go, that was really lousy, wasn't it? And I'd go, because <coughs> sometimes it was, because he wasn't prepared enough. But in fairness, Father Michael, he's one busy dude. And man, I tell you, how many times he was up there after being up all night at the hospital? Being with a family who just lost a child. I mean, so I, I'm not picking on this lack of preparation. I'm not kidding, no time to prepare. So I'm just saying, I, I just had to be prepared myself. Um, and another one. He, is, he was also really good at winging it. And he was really good at winging it. Yeah, he said, I thrive on chaos. Well, you know, I'm sorry, but I don't want to create chaos. I'm going to throw up there and give it a homily. You can't in the parking lot. You can't the parking saying he's he is risen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's no, we, are, we, are, we all have fine memories there. there. Yeah, yeah, he was great. Yeah. Can I say something on that? Yeah, sure. A lot of times we prepare, but God gives us something good just in that moment. In that, in right, at that moment. And that's why we have to really listen, which is what I was talking about this morning in the homily. Yeah. God gives us the words, right? Yeah. And he even said the Holy Spirit will teach us and tell you what to say. Yeah. This may not be the place to, That's okay. to, to hammer this out. Um, <laughs> I, 